So thanks very much, Rick, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, appreciate the invitation to appear here today and for that kind introduction. I am glad you did not attempt to summarize the variety of alleged honors and awards that I've received because I view myself probably as one of the most over-honored people of the world, which only comes about because my name on programs helps organizations to raise money. It has nothing, it has nothing to do with what I've done for that organization. Um, but I want to begin today by congratulating the Media Institute for your critical work promoting the essential role of free speech, the free press, and the First Amendment, work that we are proud to support at Comcast NBC Universal. Uh, I have to say that I think your work is even more important today when the media are under increasing scrutiny over their capacity to report the news objectively and with rising concerns about the roles and responsibilities of digital platforms. Amidst all the confusing swirl in Washington these days, and that might be a dramatic understatement, the beginning of public impeachment hearings, on again, off again, markups of Stellar in the House and the Senate, Supreme Court arguments on DACA, and even a Supreme Court argument on our dispute with Byron Allen, I am pleased to let you know that I am not going to dwell on a litany of public policy minutia in my remarks today. Instead, I want to pull the lens back a little bit, take a broader view, and hopefully leave all of you with the desire to do that as well, both at lunch and when we leave. So as the news media know better than anyone, the great story of our times is change. Dramatic, accelerating, and often disruptive change. Forget about the change that's occurred since May of 2011, think about the change that has occurred for, since May of 2019 um, to get a sense and the flavor of what we are going through. So the key question for me, not only for this lunch, but as I think about life in America these days, is whether our economy, our educational institutions, and our system of democratic self-government can harness this change for everyone's benefit or whether the tidal wave of change is just going to sweep over us and result in disruption and not improvement. So to meet the challenges of change, I think we have to act, think big and act boldly. Frankly, I am concerned that our growing divisions, our self-selecting news bubbles, the tribalization of our politics, the noxious contempt that each side has for the other are making it harder to solve big problems. The environment is certainly not conducive to serious dialogue or to constructive problem solving. All too often, we are obsessed with small ball disputes and not the historic challenges that confront us going forward. As daunting as these big picture challenges are, I am still a glass half full kind of guy. I come from a place of optimism, believing that we can f harness all of this change and come out in a better place in the end. So Comcast's history is not a bad way to tell that story. I think we show how a company can keep growing by betting on the future and not fretting about the past, and how we can harness change and growth to benefit a broad population in a widespread array of communities. Since that's what our whole industry is all about. So everyone here may not know that Comcast was founded in 1963 as a community antenna television provider with 1,200 customers in Tupelo, Mississippi, which also happens to be Elvis's hometown. Um, our founder, Ralph Roberts, always dreamed that Comcast could become a big, financially successful company that respected the individual values of its employees and the consumers and the communities that we serve. Today, we're not your parents' cable company. Starting with our first venture into broadband in 1996, we have evolved into a technology and media company built around the core of what we now call our connectivity business, providing high-speed broadband internet service to 26 million American homes. 
we are still among the largest providers of video services in America, facing a highly dynamic and increasingly competitive landscape. We are now the largest provider of satellite television in Europe. In all, we have more than 55 million high-value direct customer relationships in three of the world's five largest GDP, GDP economies. We've become one of the world's leading film, television, and news companies, and also a global theme parks company. And we are growing as a provider of business services and consumer wireless voice and data services. We employ a stunning 184,000 people. The secret sauce at Comcast is to always look forward to what's next. Consumer choice, a multiplicity of creative voices, a dynamic competitive environment, these are all our friends, not our enemies. All of these changes are bringing consumers a richness of content that would have been unimaginable a decade ago. So all of you remember at the beginning of this century, and it was only 19 years ago, um, <laughs> we dreamed about providing 500 channels. Remember people would say to me, 500 channels. Today, such a small number of choices sounds almost quaint. With the massive growth in both real-time channels and on-demand content on cable, satellite, broadband, and wireless networks, consumer choice can feel almost limitless. And just as we work to master change, and just as competition forces us to continuously up our game, it is incumbent upon America to up its game too. And in managing change, it is critical that we are sensitive to the impact of change on vulnerable communities and citizens. Because if we master change, but in doing so leave behind millions of our fellow citizens, then I would argue we haven't really mastered change at all. So my starting point is to ask whether, as a country, we're up to meeting this challenge. Are we looking around the corner? Are we thinking big? And I want to start to answer those questions by comparing ourselves with a leading economic rival, China. China thinks in terms of a 10-year plan. We tease them because as a, as, a, as a centralized economy, they actually have a 10-year plan for the future of the country. Compare that to us, where we tend to think in terms of a 24-hour news cycle, when we're thinking that long. Um, to consider these facts, in a generation, China's economy will be roughly twice as large as ours. One key reason for that is because we're losing ground in STEM, science, engineering, technology, and mathematics, the, the, the foundation of our technology economy. So since 2000, China has more than quadrupled the number of STEM degrees awarded every year at its universities. As of 2016, which is the last year we have data, China reportedly had at least 4.7 million recent graduates in STEM, more than any other nation on Earth, and nearly 10 times as many as we have graduated in the United States. In 1975, China claimed 1% of world trade flows. Now, it's closer to 25%. So clearly, China is racing full speed ahead, not merely to prepare for the next moment of transformative change, but to create it. So my point is global competition is intensifying and change is happening fast. We are in the midst of what Tom Friedman has called the age of acceleration. The exponential improvements in chips, software, storage, networking, <coughs> and sensors are enabling revolutionary new applications such as remote surgery, gene editing, driverless vehicles, and artificial intelligence. Friedman points to just one key tipping point year, and I love this story that he tells. The year was 2007, not that long ago, where Apple unveiled the iPhone, Google launched Android, Amazon debuted the Kindle, Facebook switched from being a network for college and high school kids to a platform open to anyone in the world, and Twitter was spun off from a podcasting company where it had been a side project. All that happened in 2007. 
There was another big advance that year that doesn't get as much notice as it deserves. And it was the deep, it was the debut of a geeky sounding broadband standard called DOCSIS 3.0, which gave cable companies the ability to turn our coaxial cable networks into ubiquitous data superhighways that powered the next generation of the internet. That DOCSIS 3.0 innovation put us on the path to the gigabit networks that are rolling out across America today. It's driven deployment of broadband in America. It is powering massive changes in the video marketplace and changes in so many other parts of our lives. The inventor and futurist Ray Kurzweil has also spoken to what he calls the law of accelerating returns. With each passing decade, the pace of technological change is roughly doubled. Kurzweil says these paradigm shifts create, and I quote, technological change so rapid and profound, it represents a rupture in the fabric of human history. Right now, one of the most important but scariest aspects of that revolution is the development of artificial intelligence. And we all hear about it, we may all, all mention it, but it's really worth understanding and thinking about what this development means for our country. Simple way to talk about AI is it's super smart machines doing things that human beings would otherwise do with our minds as well as our hands. PricewaterhouseCooper predicts that AI will add $15.7 trillion to the global GDP by 2030. That's like in 10 years. That's almost the size of the world's largest economy, which happens to be ours right now. But who's going to benefit from AI and who's going to suffer? PwC predicts that China will take $7 trillion of that growth. The United States and our North American neighbors will take $3.7 trillion. And the rest of the world will be left to divide the remainder. At the same time, the almost inevitable result of this revolution will be that tens of millions of Americans could lose out. So there's a recent book called AI Superpowers, um, written by computer scientist and business leader Kai-Fu Lee. A friend of mine recommended it to me. It's not the kind of book I normally like to read. I'm going to recommend it to you because everybody should read this book. It is, if half of it is right, it will be the scariest horror book you have ever read, except it's not a novel. It's a real life story. So, Kai-Fu Lee foresees that artificial intelligence is going to replace 40 to 50% of all existing jobs in the US. 40 to 50%. Those who will keep their jobs or get new ones will be the best educated, the most highly skilled workers, as well as those who provide services to people that machines just can't duplicate. And China's government is funding and increasing the status of the AI industry. Its tech startup culture is more aggressive than other countries, including ours. Its large population produces more AI engineers. And because of its huge population, Lee explains in the book, and I quote, if data is the new oil, then China is the new Saudi Arabia. Now let me be clear, I don't blame China for making the most of its advantages. I don't blame China for investing in the future and looking forward. Admire or criticize, China is thinking big, thinking about the future, looking around corners, not waiting to react, but, wait, but investing to create the future for China and for the rest of the world. So I think that China activity raises questions for us. How do we lead rather than follow change? How do we manage the impacts of technological change and harness them to improve our quality of life, maintain our economic leadership, and rebuild our national sense of community. So right at the top of my list is the readiness of our workforce. That task is going to require bold leadership, a Marshall Plan, if you will, to prepare our workforce for what economist Klaus Martin Schwab, chairman of the World Economic Forum, calls the fourth industrial revolution. How do we retrain and modernize our workforce? What jobs are we even training them to do? And where will those jobs be located? 
While the official unemployment numbers appear good, just check the president's Twitter feed, we know that workforce participation is down and many do, do jobs are in the independent economy, such as Uber drivers or part-time, where the customary benefits of full-time employment are not available. Millions of Americans are working more at the costs of housing, their kids' education, and their health care are growing much faster than their incomes. Now, please don't get depressed after I've given you that litany of depressing <laughs> statistics. I think there are some general principles that can guide America as we address these challenges. If readying our workforce and fixing our politics are our big think challenges, we must keep in mind three guiding lights that will help us shape that undertaking. First, we have to sit down together. We have to stop shouting at each other. We have to start listening and chart a common course to move America forward. In short, we need to bring civility back into our political discourse. Second, we have to make sure that in our, in our increasingly diverse society, all of us have a seat at the table because we're not gonna be able to solve these challenges and these problems without taking advantage of the diversity that is one of the great strengths of America. And third, we must make sure that at a time when our public square is situated in cyberspace as well as physical space, that we get everyone connected to the fountain of information and ideas, something we otherwise call the internet, and train them to be able to hold down the 21st century jobs that are gonna be created in this fourth industrial revolution. So let me briefly speak to these three, um, to these three issues in turn. Um, first, addressing polarization and partisanship. At a time when technology is hurtling forward, our political system is gridlocked and our policy making is paralyzed. That is not news in this room. In such an environment, how can government possibly play a constructive role in helping all Americans adapt to accelerating change. Here in Washington, we all know what we're up against. The administration and Congress still struggle to come up with a plan to fund regular operations of the government on an annual basis, instead relying on a series of temporary short-term extensions, which is hardly good practice for thinking big. America's unfinished business includes reams of legislation that have been held hostage in stalemates between the administration and both houses of Congress. No infrastructure bill for our roads, mass transit, water supply, electrical grid, and other physical networks. No prescription drug reform. No trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. No immigration reform. All issues that there is broad consensus need to be addressed in this country. The causes of this gridlock are also reflected in the partisan rifts between regular Americans back home. And we have to face the fact that accelerating changes in society have played a role in polarizing public debate. While social media may be a fantastic way to communicate, may bring friends and family closer, social media also help to drive citizens and voters apart. As my team tells me all the time, Conflict gets more clicks than consensus, but our democracy often suffers from a less informed and more inflamed citizenry as a result. The culture of perpetual conflict may help build fundraising and social media followers, but I don't think it moves us any closer to common sense solutions. Discord and distrust are at record highs in our country. According to the Pew Research Center, 75% of Americans believe their fellow citizens' trust in the federal government is decreasing, and 64% believe that our distrust of each other is increasing. Arthur Brooks, one of my favorite writers, recently wrote about what he has branded our culture of contempt. He called out the outrage industrial complex that tells us that we are completely right Completely right, there's no black and white issue here. While those we oppose are completely wrong, and not only wrong, but contemptible, illegitimate, and even evil. And that won't help us think big either. 
As Americans are increasingly preoccupied by our divisions, we are failing to address the policy changes we need to succeed in the global contest for leadership. Our nation needs to move beyond scorched earth politics to finding common ground for the common good. And we can begin by dealing with issues that are not about the left, not about the right, but moving forward as a nation together with a common purpose. We have to move forward beyond small ball if we are going to think big. So in our industry, and I said I wouldn't do minutia of public policy, I'm just going to do two issues as examples of small ball issues that it's time to put aside. One of them is privacy, where there's a broad consensus about principles of privacy that should be put in place and should be put in place at the federal level so we don't have a balkanization of 50 different state privacy regimes. And the second is net neutrality, my two least favorite words in the English language. <laughs> no matter how many, no matter how long ago that I would have come here, I probably would have mentioned the words net neutrality. And my headline news for today is that the debate over net neutrality is over. It's not news anymore. We all agree about what needs to be done. We simply must put aside the, the irresistible temptation to fight, to try and gain, to try and fundraise, to try and gain social media clicks um, and followers and decide to do what needs to be done, which is to put in place federal regimes around both privacy um, and, and net neutrality. Um, those, that's a, those are typical small ball issues that get in the way of our being able to focus on the future. I want to be ridiculous and don't want to say we should do what China does, but I guarantee you, you do not see a 20-year raging debate in China around privacy and net neutrality. It wouldn't be tolerated because they're moving on. China's moving on to our real big issues in the future. Second issue is getting everyone at the table. So while we need more problem solving, less shouting, we also need to be sure that every segment of our increasingly diverse society has a seat at the table. If any group of Americans is not fully engaged in the next phase of global competition, then we risk leaving large segments of our population behind and disaffected. That makes us weaker as a nation. In less than a quarter of a century, by 2045, we, accept Ameri we expect America to become a majority-minority nation. I've said before, as someone who will be the ultimate of minority, both a white and a male, I'm looking forward to this. I think our country is, it's one of the strengths of our company to embrace the diversity of our people. But building an inclusive society is necessary to help ensure that the rapid change we're experiencing leaves no one behind. We enthusiastically embrace this, this concept at Comcast. It's an important part of our creed, our values, and our common purpose. And our commitment to diversity and inclusion and equity is why we find the rhetoric surrounding the Supreme Court case involving Byron Allen's cable channels, which should have been routine program carriage dispute so distasteful and, yes, offensive. It's just another example of small ball posturing for personal financial gain. It's not going to advance the global interests of our country, um, and it's not going to advance the interests of the people who Byron Allen alleges that he is speaking for. And certainly not how Comcast acts. Forty percent of our board is diverse. We've made diversity and inclusion a C-suite responsibility at our company. The Wall Street Journal recently noted that only five companies in the S&P 500 have a C-level chief inclusion officer or chief diversity officer. I'm proud that Comcast NBC Universal is one of those five companies, and I'm honored to serve in that role for our company. Throughout our workforce, we are hiring and advancing diverse talent. 62% of our workforce is diverse today. In 2018, 71% of the people we hired were diverse. At the level of vice president or higher, more than half of our 
of our vice presidents and above are diverse, 21% people of color and 39% women. My new favorite DNI statistic is that at year end 2018, 53% of our workforce reported to a diverse leader. And that, that's not an accident. That was a design because we all know that diverse leadership attracts more diverse talent and embraces diversity with a spirit of inclusion that white males would not be able to do. Our supplier network includes more than 3,000 diverse businesses owned by women, people of color, veterans, individuals with disabilities, and LGBTQ individuals. We did more than $4 billion of business with those diverse suppliers in 2018, and more than $18 billion in total since 2011. So we're trying to do our part to make sure that we are all on the same team, building a better future together. Inclusiveness is a critical North Star at Comcast MPC Universal, and I'm gonna argue that it needs to be a critical North Star for our country as we solve for the big picture challenges that will define our place in the world economy going forward. Last, getting everyone connected. So in addition to less shouting, more problem solving, and more inclusiveness, we also have to make sure that everyone is prepared to compete in the 21st century jobs economy. And that starts with getting everyone digitally connected. The internet has this incredible power to level the playing field, to equalize opportunity for everyone. But the cruel irony of the digital divide is that the more the internet advances, the further behind it leaves people without home internet connections. The very people who would benefit the most from its equalizing potential and the very people who are most at risk on missing out on our digital economy in the future. It's just a truism that with the accelerating pace of technological change, those who are not connected to the internet, those who do not develop 21st century digital skills are most at risk of being left behind. And that's why Comcast launched our Internet Essentials program in 2011. The program's design is based on the significant amount of research into the major barriers to broadband adoption. So we provide low-cost, high-speed data connections, options to purchase heavily discounted and subsidized computer equipment. But most importantly, and most expensive, because the research shows that digital literacy issues are the number one barrier to broadband adoption, Internet Essentials provides significant digital literacy training programs in print, online, and in person, developed through, delivered through a network of tens of thousands of nonprofit and governmental partners. So the results of this integrated approach bear out the wisdom of that research. We've now connected more than 8 million low-income Americans to the Internet at home since 2011. 90% of them did not have a home Internet connection at the time they signed up for Internet Essentials, and a recent study found that two-thirds of them would still be unconnected but for Internet Essentials. So driving broadband connectivity is a condition proceeding to limiting the collateral job loss from the dramatic